Good morning, everyone. Yeah, everybody's awake. Awesome. We want to welcome you to Eagle Creek this morning. So glad that you're here for our service. And I uh, just want to invite you to go ahead and stand as we pray and give our time to the Lord. Father, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who sits high and uh, on your throne, Lord, in heaven above, we just, uh, Lord, we recognize this morning how much we need you. We need you moment by moment, Lord. It's not just a quiet time in the morning here and there or a word here and there, but, Lord, throughout the day, Lord, we need your grace. We need you, Lord. Thank you that you've gifted us who are in Christ, your spirit that resides in us, Lord, to go wherever we go, Lord, and to take us wherever you are leading us, Lord. So we praise you this morning that we are here together as, as um, either as saints or as visitors, Lord, to just come and fellowship and enjoy, hear about you and sing to you, Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So we lift up this time, pray that you would bless it. In Jesus' name, amen.
this week, we um, talked about love and judgment and how we can oftentimes conflate the two. Um, and it can come across in various ways from people saying, you know, how could, how could a loving God send people to hell, right? Or that even believing that all paths lead to heaven eventually, that we all can get to heaven uh, apart from Christ and Christ alone. But I was reminded in this next song just how much God loves us. 
that he gives us all the tools and all the things in the world, Lord, that our cups are overflowing. Even if you're not a believer in Christ today, God loves you. And God is pouring out his grace day by day. And it says in Romans 5, 8, which we know this verse, but it is so rich. God demonstrated his love in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. He looked at a bride that was corrupted by sin, that was ratty and nasty, and he said, I'm going to redeem that. I'm going to buy that back. I'm going to make it the way that I purposed the bride, my creation, and I'm going to buy it back. And he said in John 3, we know John 3, 16, but it's 7 into 18. Please read these. These are rich verses. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Christ didn't come to condemn point fingers and all that. We were already condemned in our sin. He didn't need to do that. We were already lost. We were already uh, you know, broken and accursed. He came to save us, to bring us out of that. The light came into the world to bring us out of the darkness, to expose the darkness for what it is. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe, and here's the warning, is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And then thinking even further, too, about his justice, it's beautiful, too, that God is a righteous judge who will not leave us in the place that we're at and leave all this sin and brokenness. We're promised in Revelation 12, 4, he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be no mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he's already doing some of that, but all of it will be removed when he comes back as the victorious king that he already is. So let's sing of how he loves us so much.
You can go ahead and have a seat. We're going to have a few announcements here. Thank you, worship team. Don't you love that song? Amen. You know, uh, this is uh, Valentine's week, and uh, I heard a pastor on the radio this week speaking about uh, his courtship with his bride-to-be, and he told her, he says, I'm not going to tell you I love you until I'm ready to ask you to marry me. I thought that was a little unusual. And they dated for three years. They respected each other. And then on that special day, he brought her a bouquet of balloons and different messages inside them. And the last one he gave her, she popped it open and it said, I love you. And she said, you mean you want to marry me? He says, yes, will you marry me? You know, all of us are looking for love, aren't we? And I can remember, you know, times feeling so unloved. And then I remember that on the cross, Jesus popped open that balloon and he said, I love you and I want you to be mine. Praise God for the love of God, for the love of Christ. I've got a few announcements. That, that was free, by the way. <laughs> a few announcements. Uh, some of them have been scrolling. Uh, we want to remind uh, men that uh, we're starting a new Conquer series. If you want to be part of that, see me afterwards. There's a special thing coming up for young mothers uh, on March 12th. We're just starting to talk about it. It's called a Thrive for Moms Only for uh, mothers of uh, young children. It'll be at, here at the church, time of teaching encouragement from 8.30 to 11.30 on March 12th, and breakfast will be provided. So, moms, you don't have to get breakfast for your kids that day. Well, I guess the kids won't be here, right? So you probably have to get breakfast for them anyway. <laughs> have Dad do it that day. Easter egg um, coming up, a way to reach out to our community. We're going to do that again this year. Just be thinking about that on April 16th. Pray that God will use that to allow us to connect with some families in the neighborhood. And then a talent show fundraiser for the uh, upcoming missions trip. Every time we have a missions trip, we've been having a talent show. And we have seen some unusual talents, have we not? And uh, it's always a lot of fun, and uh, so that'll be coming up. Time to be announced yet, but be thinking about what you might want to do that for that. It can be uh, just a single person. It can be a group. You can do readings. You can do poetry. You can do drama. You can do uh, singing. You can do mime, I guess, whatever you want to do. So uh, come, and, come and thrill us, and it's for a good cause to raise money for our mission trip. Then I do want to highlight that uh, this announcement didn't make the, the screen today, but uh, we're going to be starting another adult Sunday school class on March the 6th, the first Sunday in March at 9.15. And our, our group decided we wanted to study the book of Judges. And uh, let me tell you, Judges is a, is a difficult book. It's a difficult book. But uh, we found a fantastic little study guide on it from Dr. Warren Wiersbe, uh, who's written many, many excellent study guides on the books, the Bible, all the books of the Bible. I think former pastor of Moody Bible Institute, or Moody Church and president of Moody Bible Institute, and uh, it's called Be Available, Be Available, and basically he looks at the judges as men and women who made themselves available to God to use to help his people, and it really speaks to us as Christians uh, how we need to be available to God also. So uh, if you want to sign up for that, you can respond to the email that was sent out online, or there's a sign-up sheet and a copy of the study guide out there. It'll be 12 bucks each for the study guide. We've already got several people signed up. 
We also need several people to volunteer to provide childcare during that time so that we can rotate, not have to have someone do that every Sunday. So see me afterwards for that if you want to. Ray. I think we can let the kids go to their classrooms. Is this backwards for some reason? <laughs> All right. Does that mean we give the message backwards this morning? <laughs> It's good to see everyone. Every day this winter goes by, I'm looking more and more forward to spring. It's a little cold this morning. Well, we are at uh, part four of our series that we have entitled Kitchen Table Apologetics, Knowing Why You Believe. And uh, as we have reminded you every week, our key verse is from 1 Peter 3.15. The key idea is that we need to be able to give an answer to anyone who asks us to tell them about the hope. Why do we have this hope? And uh, we need to be able to do that with gentleness and respect. And I appreciate this verse a lot because it highlights something that the Christian faith has that no other religion has, and that's hope. You know, our hope is eternal. Our hope is sure because of the life and the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, so far, we've answered three questions. Does God exist? Why would a good God allow pain and suffering and evil and then last week, Jay helped us to be able to answer the question, what is truth? You know, I appreciate what Scott shared. I think, I don't know if it was when he was doing the announcements or leading worship, but uh, what he said about himself last week, and I, I think it's probably true for a lot of us, that even after hearing a 30 or 40 minute message, we can still come away not feeling all that equipped uh, we, we need to go home and we need to study our notes. Maybe we need to listen or watch the message again. Perhaps we need to read a couple of books. But there's no doubt that if we want to become competent and able to answer these questions, then we need to take the time to make sure that we're equipped besides listening to our messages on Sunday morning. Now, this next two weeks, it's not necessarily going to be part one and part two, but they are going to complement each other. This morning, our focus is going to be Christianity and why everyone should indeed worship the God of the Bible. Next week, Dan is going to focus on other religions and why the worship of their so-called gods is, is futile. Now, so far, we've talked a lot about atheistic views, and we're going to do that more and more throughout this series. But more than 80% of the world subscribes to some form of religion. Christianity, however, is fundamentally different from every other religion in the world. And Dan's going to give us a lot of detail about that next week. Now, oftentimes, we will encounter people that might be considering belief in God, but they'd rather believe that all religions, all beliefs somehow find their way to God. Others find that it's arrogant for Christians to claim that their faith is the only one true religion. And then to others, the fact that the Bible, the God of the Bible seeks 
to glorify himself and wants to be worshiped. They, they think that's very arrogant of God to, to ask that. So these are the claims against Christianity that we're going to be talking about this morning. So with that in mind, let's just take a minute and lift our time up to the Lord. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. What a blessing. I'm always so encouraged to be together with the church family. Thank you, Lord, that you are the one who unites us all together because we all have your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to help us in our hearts, on our minds, to be ready to receive what you have for us this morning. We trust that you'll use this in our lives to help us be equipped. And if there's any that are here this morning or watching or listening, or maybe even later down the road, Lord, that you would use it to help them take hold of the truth of who you are and what you've done for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How many of you know who Tom Cruise is? Yeah, is he in any movies anymore? <laughs> you know, the big one many, many years ago was Top Gun, and then he was in the Mission Impossible series. But did you know that he's also known as a prominent member of the Church of Scientology? And he's also one of their most staunch defenders, I believe. Well, years ago, I think it was 2008, he was in an interview with Oprah Winfrey. And she asked Cruz about his beliefs. And eventually she asked him, I think it was somewhat rhetorically, so Scientologists don't believe that their way is the only way? I think it was almost as if Oprah was taking advantage of what she knew about Tom and Scientology and wanted to make her own objections to Christianity. And so how did Cruz answer the question? Well, his answer was no. And then he went on to explain how the code of Scientology says that they need to respect all other religious beliefs, and it's not about you must believe what I believe. Well, what if a Christian had been interviewed and asked that same question by Oprah? What would that person say? Well, we know what they would say. They would respond that Christians believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, to heaven. And that would more than likely have made Oprah's day prove that, yeah, those Christians are arrogant and they're reminded. Well, let's... Uh, Let's clarify a little bit our first objection. Why must Christians think that their religion alone is right? That seems to be the height of arrogance and intolerance to make those kinds of claims. Now, this is not simply a, a claim that Christians are making up. It's rooted in something. It's rooted in the words of Jesus and it's echoed by his disciples. John 14 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then in Acts 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus was very clear. And what he said, that he was the only way. And his disciples upheld his teachings, rightly so. So far from being arrogant, we Christians are simply upholding the claims of Christ that we see written in the words of God in his Bible. So let's begin answering this objection with a, a consideration of how the average person thinks in our natural world. You know, we all know that when you are going somewhere, there's usually just one road that gets to your final destination. We know that there's only one right answer to a test question. 
So why should the spiritual realm be any different? There's only one God, and, and Dan's going to talk about this next week. We're not the only religion, if you will, that believes there's only one God. Why is it so hard to imagine that he decides how people come into a right relationship with him? Surely, if he is God, it makes perfect sense that he's the one that determines the standards, calls the shots, if you will. In fact, it's just logical, if not far more logical to believe this, what we believe, than to believe that everyone makes up their own decision about how they reach heaven, how they reach their so-called God. It's kind of ludicrous to say that I'm right, you're right, that person's right, simply because they say they're right. And Jake talked a little bit about that last week. How about an illustration? If someone is driving toward Seattle, and they sincerely believe that they're driving toward New York, that doesn't change the fact that they're actually driving in the wrong direction. <laughs> Regarding different religions that think they're all right, but have various beliefs about a supreme being or afterlife, they can't all be right. But perhaps one of them is right. And of course, we know we know that the God of the Bible is the only one true God. And here we are again at the objection. Well, isn't that arrogant of us? It's certainly no more arrogant to say that anybody else's way is the right way. Now, those who declare that Christians are wrong are declaring that the beliefs of more than 2 billion people, the largest single religious group in the world, are all wrong. One way or the other, one way or the other, billions and billions of people are wrong. I think for us, Christians who should have a vision to reach the lost, that should be a stark reminder of just how many people need the Lord and how much we should be on task to share Christ. You know, the concern should not be whether or not it's arrogant to believe there's only one way to God. The concern and answer to the objection should be based upon you know, what basis can we make this claim? What is our basis for claiming that Jesus Christ alone brings people into a right relationship with God? That's the right question. And of course, the answer is what we'll come back to over and over again in this series, over and over again in our messages on Sunday morning. It's what we believe. It's what is right. That it's only the Messianic work of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. That's the only true antidote for the answer to the problem of sin in the world. You know, all religions recognize that humans somehow aren't either right with God or um, somehow aren't reaching perfection, if you will. They've fallen short. The problem is how to receive perfection or forgiveness or be reconciled. As Dan's going to talk about more next week, a lot of them emphasize good works. Some emphasize redemptive acts of suffering. Others emphasize strict moral codes or ethics. But ours, our religion, our faith, it's not a matter of doing our best and hoping for mercy. Ours is not a matter of patiently bearing our lot in this life, hoping for something better the next time around. 
Ours is not a matter of seeking ultimate nirvana, whatever that is. Maybe Dan can explain that to us next week. When the offering of sacrifices or incense or fasting or praying or good deeds is all over, in any of all, all of these, they're all left without any assurance whatsoever. But what about you and me? You and I, we can joyfully attest to the certainty of forgiveness of our sins. Our complete and sure acceptance before God now and for all eternity. We know that If we're in Christ, we already have eternal life secured because of Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He is the only one through whom sin is definitively addressed. The only one. It's through him alone that there is a way for even the worst of sinners. You know, God stepped out of eternity. He took our place on the cross. He paid the death penalty that you and I deserve to pay for our sins. And he satisfied the justice of God and definitely and absolutely secured eternal salvation for all who will put their trust in him. It is only the God of the Bible, only the Christian God, who is the one and only God who provided the necessary, effectual, sacrificial death of the Son of God on the cross. And that's what separates Christianity from all other religions. That's why he alone is to be worshiped. Now I'm going to switch gears just a bit. We've answered the objection that isn't it arrogant to say there's only one God and only one way. Now another objection used by atheists is that the God we worship is somehow needy or vain in his passion for his own glory. And that's selfish of him. Of course, in making that statement, they're proving their own ignorance, their own unwillingness, really, to humble themselves under the mighty God. But nonetheless, we need to be able to give them a gentle and respectful answer. Now, it's not a lie. It's true that the God of the Bible seeks glory for himself. Yes, he does. And a good place to see this is the account of Jesus and Lazarus and Mary and Martha. So let's look at John 11, 1 through 6. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the, uh, the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, He stayed where he was two more days. Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. That's who our God is. That is his very nature, his essence. He is love. 1 John 4, the one who does not love does not know God, for he is love. And yet, when Jesus heard about Lazarus, Instead of rushing to bring healing, or instead of healing him from a distance like he did the centurion's servant, 
He stayed where he was two more days. And then it was another day's journey to get to Bethany. So while we know that Jesus loved them, at the same time we read that he stayed, choosing not to go heal him. Well, he was motivated, yes, by the passion for the glory of God that would be displayed in his own glorious power because his intention was not to heal Lazarus, it was to raise him from the dead. Now, think about trying to convey this to someone who objects to Christianity. I can imagine it would just fuel their emotions as they think about how callous Jesus was for letting Lazarus die and for causing all this suffering and mourning to the family and the friends. And then they cry out even more that how dare God be so harsh and unloving to consider that it was all to magnify the glory of God. Well, I think we can relate this a little bit back to our message a couple weeks ago. We talked about pain and suffering. Outside of a relationship with Christ, um, people, what do they desire? They desired a pain-free life, pain-free living. Most people identify love with putting human well-being at the center. But remember, we're not God. We're not the ones to tell our Creator what real love looks like. But he did show us, though, didn't, didn't He? What real love looks like. That real love is doing whatever you need to do, even to the point of dying on the cross, to help people to be in a position to be able to experience His glory for all eternity. And we have a confirmation of this love of God demonstrated through the glorification of Christ in John chapter 17. This was Jesus' prayer right before he was going to be handed over and crucified. Let's begin in verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to pick up verse 24. As Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me and your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. In verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Do you see how the, the love of Christ drives him to pray for us and then ultimately to give his life up for us? Because of his love for those he created, he prays that, that his glory would be central and that those who believe in him will be able to experience it for all eternity. You know what? We... Christians realize that people all over the world don't realize is that there is no greater joy than to bring glory to the God who created us. He is the source of joy, and in worshiping Him, that's the only way we find true fulfillment. There is no lasting Fulfillment in worshiping any other created thing, any other so called God, or in worshiping ourselves. But God loves us enough to help us see that it is vital 
that he is always at the center, not ourselves. Because if we are made central, that is our value and our glory, then obviously it's going to distract us from what is eternally important and eternally satisfying, and that is God himself. In his love, God shows us how to exalt his glory, his value. That's the only way that this God-shaped vacuum is going to be fulfilled. And we need to help people see that Christ alone is our all-satisfying and everlasting treasure. You know, I appreciate the words of Pastor John Piper. He said, the supremacy of God's glory is the source and sum of all full and lasting joy. It really is. Now, before we wrap things up, I, I did want to spend just a little bit of time discussing why it is important to worship God. It's not because God needs it. It's not because he's vain. It's not because we are forced to. It is because he is the creator. In the fourth chapter of Revelation, John sees a vision of God on his throne in heaven. And surrounding the throne are four living creatures and 24 elders. They're all worshiping God. And in verse 11, it says, You are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being. They're proclaiming together that God is worthy of our worship because he is the creator. Because all things have their being in him. Reminded me of Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 17, that life cannot exist without God. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You know, we could spend a whole nother all-day seminar talking about this amazing creation. You know, the size and complexity of the universe, it's incomprehensible to, to most of us as we start thinking about it. You know, from the tiniest microscopic particle to the vastness of the galaxies. It's all intricate, well-designed, and the more we learn about this world that we inhabit, the more wonderful we understand that it is. Think about it this way. You know, we look at a, an artistic masterpiece, or we look at, how many of you are watching the Olympics? Yeah, we look at amazing athletic performances. We look at an amazing feat of engineering, and we express, express praise towards those who created or, or performed so greatly. They're thought to be worthy of praise because of what they have done. How much more so for the one who produced the universe that we inhabit more than any other person, place, or thing, the creator of all is worthy of all glory and honor and praise and worship. We also worship him because he is our Lord. And that's not a word that we throw around much today, but it's used extensively in the Bible. It refers to one who is in charge. I think it's a good description of the term for God. He is the sovereign Lord, the ruler of heaven and earth. And as such, he is worthy of our worship. First Chronicles 16, 29, we're told, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor 
of his holiness. The Psalms are just filled with praises to the Lord, including Psalm 95, verse 6. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Jesus also says it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He alone, he alone is worthy of adoration and worship. We worship him because he is our redeemer. We sing about this. We talk about this. And throughout the pages of the Bible, you can read about how God is at work throughout history to draw people to himself. Because we are a fallen race. You know, all the problems in the world today are because of our sin nature. We're separated from God because of sin. But God provided a perfect sacrifice, a substitute for you and me. I was reading Genesis this past week, and it was good to be reminded of how Abraham was willing to offer up his son Isaac. The very son who through whom God through whom God promised generations of offspring. Well, God was testing him. And God, what did he do? Instead, he provided a substitute for a sacrifice. Isaac was spared, but Jesus Christ wasn't spared. He took our place on the cross. And as a result, He attributes to those who will choose to believe in his name the righteousness of Christ given to us. He adopts us into his family as his children. And he has prepared an eternal home, eternal future, so that we can be with him and experience his glory for all eternity. Why did he do that? Because we deserved it? (laughs) No, not because of anything we did. Because he's he's our creator, and he loves us so very much. And as our creator, God is worthy of our worship. But how much more worthy is he because of what he did for us? Because he redeemed us, paid for our sin. And finally, we worship him because he is worthy. Because he's worthy. Philippians chapter 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, in the end, when Jesus Christ returns to this earth, everyone will bow before God. They will acknowledge him as Lord. And when the time comes, his glory and his majesty will overwhelm everyone. (laughs) And those who do not believe may think that they're going to raise their fists in defiance. But instead, they're going to fall on their faces before the one and only true God and acknowledge that He is Lord. He is God. But unfortunately, it's too late at that point. As for you and me and all who will choose to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we will bow before God, not because we have to, but because we acknowledge how loving and gracious and merciful and wonderful and glorious He is, and He's worthy. When it's all said and done, yes, there is only, well, first of all, there is a God. And there's only one God. And there's only one way, one way to be made right with God and to be with him in his heaven for all eternity. And yes, God is worthy 
both now and forever, evermore, of our worship and our praise. And yes, God wants to share His glory with anyone, whosoever, will humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, repent of sin in their lives, and place their trust in the risen Christ who died because He loves them and wanted to pay for their sin and rose again so that they could live with Him for all eternity. And we pray that if you have not made that decision, you will choose to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God even today, we pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are so amazing, so glorious. Lord, help us to make your glory, your worship, the center of our lives, not ourselves. Lord, help us to be equipped to be able to give an answer to those who ask for the hope that is in us. We pray for anyone who is still seeking or maybe even doesn't have any inclination any desire to want to believe that you would be at work in their hearts to change them, help them to see that you are God and that you love them because you created them and you long for them to be with you. We thank you that you are such a gracious God and we worship you this morning. We praise you. Help us to live for you every moment of every day of our lives for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, if you would go ahead and stand, I invite you to stand with me, and um, I want to just take a moment and give thanks for that message, for um, what we've received already from the Lord. So if you just bow your heads, and to yourself too, just give thanks for whatever God has done here in this moment for you. So, Father, we thank you so much for every Sunday and many times throughout the week, Lord, to gather together as believers. Lord, it's so sweet to have brothers and sisters in Christ, to have the body that is here, that you don't just save us and whisk us away, Lord, to heaven, that we are here together, Lord, supporting one another, serving one another, that we get to be a part of what you're doing and be led by the head that is you, Jesus, and that you lead us into day by day. Even as we leave here, Lord, you, leave us, you lead us back into Lord, our daily uh, activities, Lord, even uh, may we have opportunities as we go to Super Bowl parties tonight, Lord, to rub shoulders with our friends and our family and just share about your goodness with others, Lord, and give thanks and tell of your wondrous deeds to all around us. Lord, that is who we are. We are your children. It's not what we do. It's who we are. It is in you, Lord. And so may that shine, may that come out of us, Lord and tell of the one way that is in Jesus to others. In Jesus' name, amen.
next song, um, many of you know probably 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. But I've shared these verses that I've been meditating on, man, for a while now. But it just always comes back to this, that God's grace is sufficient and enough and new every single day. It never ceases. It never ends. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never uh, ceases. Uh, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I just want to, uh, before we sing this last song, remind that God answers our prayers all the time. You know, sometimes we think God only answers our prayers when it says yes and when it's in agreement with what we think. But God always answers our prayers. It's either with a no, a wait, a not yet, or not this way. He answers our prayers oftentimes in ways that we just never imagined, better than we ever imagined, because He knows what's best for us. He knows us better than ourselves. Amen? Amen. So let's sing that His grace is enough for us.
Have a great week, and hopefully we'll see you next week.